postmodernism can leave a lot of people cold. You can get fed up with its abstraction, with its little flights of surrealist fantasy, with its bizarre underpinnings, with its readiness to let go of all realistic conventions. So modernism can have a lot of built-in opposition with the reader, but it's hard to be uh, indifferent when uh, certain works come up. And one of them that is probably the most remarkable that everybody remembers and has an opinion about one way or the other is Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis. Kafka is writing in the wake of Sigmund Freud gaining some popularity, investing uh, great attention in art uh, into dreams. Uh, the value of the dream state, the surrealist um, evocation of a dream state, the idea that we are all just a bunch of suppressed desires and civilization is crowding in on us and frustrating those desires which are going to find other ways to crack out into the realm of expression. Uh, and Kafka taps into a lot of that and he is uh, almost unique in what he is able to achieve in a vision of uh, a frustrated psychology that is impinged upon by the modern world. Kafka has become his own adjective. Kafka-esque is a thing that people automatically know what you mean. And it usually means some kinds of uh, imposing uh, terror of, uh, well, not terror, but just oddity that evokes a kind of terror because it's so strange and so bizarre that there, you cannot scale it. There is no purchase of, uh, for a reasonable approach because he is in essence so unrealistic. There's nothing reasonable about him. Everything in Kafka is a kind of nightmare dream, dream state. He is the swirling skies of Van Gogh with Edvard Munch's scream tossed into the middle of it. He is, oh, he is horror. Uh, but that doesn't mean he can't be really funny. A lot of people do see him as really quite funny. And you can read everything that he writes in a number of different ways. You can read it as, you know, horror and, oh, it's just so scary and it's so imposing and the psychological torture. And, ah. Or you can read it as uh, making fun of that, of needling people who are so obsessed with their own psychology so self-absorbed that they feel victimized by the world. And you can read him that way with a certain ironic detachment. You can read him as, uh, as a victim. You can read him as, uh, as, as, the, as the torturer. He subjects readers to an awful lot of bizarre um, aggressive behavior that is uh, torturous for the characters in his stories but often quite uncomfortable for the uh, for the reader as well and yet he he does not appear to be any of that he appears to be all of it and none of it simultaneously which is so hard to pin down you can't really come to an understanding with Kafka because there's no understanding to be had you take his work as just what it is. And you can like it, you can hate it, you can laugh at it, you can have nightmares about it. It's all fair game. Uh, and the most famous, he wrote a, a number of uh, iconic works, but the most famous, the one that most people have heard of and the most people have read is the metamorphosis um and it is uh, it, it's bizarre K 
came out, I believe, in 1915 in, uh, oh, when he was, uh, he was just an obscure clerk, essentially, living in uh, Eastern Europe, trying to make money as a writer, trying to crack out of uh, whatever, you know, squalid little middle-class life he was li living. He was he was well off enough, comfortable enough, that he was given an education. And in the long line of uh, 19th century uh, pencil pushers, he felt like he was uh, having his individual uh, individuality stifled, I suppose, in, uh, in this vast bureaucratic urban dystopia uh, that had grown up throughout the century and disrupted ways of life and left a lot of people feeling alienated and alone. And that alienation takes on a physical form in the metamorphosis when with the very first famous, famous sentence uh, opening sentence. When Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from troubled dreams, he found himself transformed right there in his bed into some sort of monstrous insect. Translation is difficult. Uh, different translators are going to take this in a number of different ways. Kafka wrote in a sort of arcane little uh, dialect, it's my understanding. Uh, so that those uh, that opening sentence, like pretty much all Kafka sentences. Kafka sentences tend to be very long. German sentences in general can go on for quite a while and be wildly attenuated within, you know, uh, line after line after line before you get to a period. Uh, so they are naturally a little all over the place. And the syntax is uh, very complicated. And so this first line does get changed around an awful lot depending on the uh the translation but the idea is always there and they always no matter what the translation is the the ideas carry it because kafka while he does certain things with language that can come out in uh in translation it is primarily about the ideas um gregor samsa awoke one morning from troubled dreams so immediately Troubled dreams, ding, 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 the age of Freud, uh, we're in some sort of a weird, bizarre, dream statey uh, milieu. Uh, he found himself transformed right there in his bed into some sort of monstrous insect. Um, insect sometimes gets translated as cockroach or sometimes bed bug. Uh, it, it's uh, vermin from time to time with some translations. It's all and it's it's a complicated uh business this translation thing and he is hotly debated but the idea is he wakes up and he has had fitful dreams and he is suddenly an insect and well you can look at that so many different ways who among us hasn't uh slammed our hand down on the uh, on the alarm and just groan like, oh god not again because you feel like an insect because you're just waking up at an unnaturally early hour to go to a job you perhaps just don't want to deal with that day and there are all these pressures in life and you are always forced to just keep going, just keep going, just keep going. And there's no sense of individuality in that. There is no sense of satisfying what you want. It's just about serving on a large assembly line, bureaucratic culture, doing what anybody else could do just as well you might as well not even exist it would be fine without you it's hard to feel fulfilled in that role so immediately that notion that gets off right off with the first sentence is identifiable as weird as the literal idea is it's recognizable because 
everybody who's ever had a job or gotten up, you know, for school to go to a class they really didn't want to go to, uh, you know that feeling. And so it's bizarre yet familiar. And that's where Kafka's genius really lies because he dwells in that area of where the bizarre is somehow recognizable, somehow uh, empathetic, somehow reflective of something within you that maybe you didn't even know was there. Um, he wakes up and he, the treatment of it is very realistic. Uh, it, the declaration right off the bat is just, you know, very matter of fact. He woke up, found himself to be a giant insect. Oh, well, okay. Um, he was lying on his back, which was hard like a carapace. And when he raised his head a little, he saw his curved brown belly segmented by rigid arches atop which the blanket, already slipping, was just barely managing to cling. His many legs, pitiful, pitifully thin compared to the rest of him, waved helpless before his eyes. So you get the sense of this little creature with all of a sudden all of these legs that he's never really had to deal with before. So he, he doesn't know how to deal with anything. And it's just alien. It's alienating. He feels alienated from his own identity at this point. His physical being has become something he does not recognize and his sense of identity is now detached from that physical being um, and very significantly Kafka points out immediately uh, what in the world has happened to me he thought it was no dream stating that right off the bat it was no dream so you can scratch that off of your list of possibilities for interpretation. The reader is going to naturally sort of scramble with that. It's like, hey, what is this? And as all of those little details are going to be dropped and you're constantly told in these opening moments where he is struggling to get out of bed and he's struggling to stand up and he's struggling to turn around and you get all of these very physical um, descriptions of trying to do something. It's very mimetic, it's very, uh, it, it's great verisimilitude. It, it gives you the sense of him, he is actually a bug. It's not just a fantasy, it's not just a feeling. He doesn't feel like a bug, he is a bug. Now, you have to buy into that in order for the story to work. If, if you're willing to just go with, well, sure, it is like, well, who hasn't felt like a bug from time to time? If you're, if you're determined to deal with it on that representational level, the story really doesn't hold up as well. But if you just go with it, it's, uh, it, it's remarkable. It's very powerful and it's mysterious because there are no real answers to this. He's suddenly just a bug. We never learn why. We never see a great transformation. He just wakes up, oh, I'm a bug. And that's strange. That makes you think a little bit more about the world around you. Like, you know, does this actually happen? Can somebody do this? And the writing is so often so spot on, so physical, so realistic that you kind of get, oh yeah, I guess he is a bug. You don't dwell on the why, because there is no why. And Kafka doesn't really sit there and have him wonder about it too much. He just sort of accepts it and moves on. And the writer or the reader goes with him because, okay, sure. What's next? Uh, there is no sense of right or wrong or why or reason we're all just moving forward through time trying to make the best of whatever situation we have um the uh let's see we learned that he is very concerned about oversleeping because his uh because he's going to be late for work uh, it is still very early, but it, apparently his boss or one of his boss's assistants or something 
uh, waits for him at the train station and watches for him. And if he's not getting off the train to go into the office at what is probably a very early hour, then he is, uh, well, then he's in trouble. And he, this is very much on his mind. And he knows that, oh, and, and he's very courteous or he's very conscientious too about what that would mean, not just for himself. He doesn't want to be in trouble, but he's most concerned about his family. We're told that he is, um, uh, he is the, well, he is the main support for his family. His father, his mother, and his sister all live in this one rather large apartment, it seems. And uh, he is their support. Now we're going to learn more about that as the story moves on. But in this opening scene, we're just told that, okay, his, his, his parents are coming by and knocking on his door, you know, Gregor, 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 get up. Why are you oversleeping? Gregor, Gregor. And they're nagging him. And he knows that they, that he is late and he feels bad about this. But of course, uh, he probably has a good excuse and he doesn't necessarily want to, uh, be discovered just yet. So, you know, he, his mom and dad are knocking on the door and he's just sitting there like, Oh, you know, they've never seen this. Um, there's feelings of guilt, feelings of shame, feelings of, um, oh, frustration that are coursing through him as he's trying to negotiate around the room uh, and get himself up and is trying to talk to them. They're asking him these questions and he's struggling to make his voice understood. And well, it's not necessarily a human voice anymore. But in the beginning, they seem to be uh, able to piece it together or it's not bringing up too much uh, conspicuous notice. Um, as he was sitting there, he, uh, he says at one point, uh, you know, if only I had, uh, well, by the time uh, Gregor was already protruding halfway out of his bed, this new method was more of a game than a struggle. All he had to do was keep rocking sideways a little at a time. It occurred to him how simple things would be if only someone came to his aid. Uh, a couple things on that. He is uh, hemmed in by the laws of physics. So denying, uh, you know, accepting rather, the, uh, the fact that he has transformed into a large bug, he is calculating like, okay, to turn over, I just need to rock back and forth and get some momentum going and then some leverage and then I can pitch myself up. So he's trying to think very logically in terms of the laws of nature, which I particularly think is rather funny in this situation. But also then he says, you know, it would be so simple if only someone would come to his aid. Now, this is an interesting uh, uh, phrasing of this, someone come to his aid. He is used to getting up very early. He's a traveling salesman. And so he's, he's always leaving home. He's struggling. He is supporting his whole family as we're going to learn. Uh, and yet we're in this situation, you know, it would just be nice if someone could help me. Hmm. Two strong individuals, he specifies. He was thinking of his father and the maid. Um, he sees his father as strong. That's the first real um, uh, description we have of the father father, or at least of his impression of him. Uh, Gregor sees his father as very strong. And that's important. That's going to come back. Um, <laughs> his father and his mother are sitting there knocking on the door. Come on, come on, come on, get up. And there's a knock on the door, a uh, knock on the front door of the apartment. And they go and answer it. And who should it be but Gregor's boss, <laughs> which is just a bizarre thing that your boss is showing up at. This is just uh, a little after seven in the morning, apparently, and 
it's already been determined that Gregor is late and the boss is showing up at his house or at his apartment to ask him why what's the problem why are we so late today um, another sense of the unreality of it of the hyperbolic nature of a lot of this um, or maybe he's just a really awful boss I don't know but the boss comes in and they start asking him about it and the uh, the parents are sitting there come on Gregor, open the door. Gregor is still struggling to get out of bed. Um, and uh, the mom comes in. And the mom is like a very typical, uh, quite frankly, Jewish mother. Uh, she's sitting there, you know. Um, uh, so please open the door. Um, I'm sure he, your boss, will be kind enough not to take offense at the untidiness of your room. <laughs> Which is a beautiful little passive aggressive moment that, you know, uh, it, it, it applies to pretty much all mothers. Uh, but the stereotypical Jewish mother, most of all, I'm gonna guess. Um, and then she turns to the boss and says, he is it well. <laughs> you see, he can be very funny if you just let yourself into the uh, uh, into the into the reality of the moment. It can be very funny. Um, it's you go with it, and it's hysterical. This particular translation captures that whimsy. I would say a little bit more than others, which can be very heavy and ponderous from time to time. This, you know, it's sort of showing that little uh, that little wry smile every now and then. Um, <laughs> the uh, they're always knocking at the door and you hear doors off in the distance as his sister is woken up and she runs out to get help and the maid is scurrying around and she goes out to get help and then they go and they get uh, um, uh, the boss comes by through a door and you hear more door slamming and there's all this door slamming it's 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 a rather bizarrely large and segmented apartment a lot of critics like speculating on the the architecture of it uh, but one thing that is very prevalent is the there there's a profusion of doors and a lot of door references which in, in certain you know big urban apartments is not all that unusual but the repeated reference to doors uh, always strikes me as something significant because um, well it's a portal a door is a portal uh, it separates but it also allows passage in and out and if you can take that little metaphor and extrapolate it to the dream state to the psychology to uh, fluid identities of all kinds um, you can make something of that. Um, but Gregor, Gregor goes, he's given up and he's starting to get comfortable and he has been practicing how to move uh, in his scurrying around and starting to get the handle of all of these little legs. And, um, He's starting to get a sense of himself as a bug. He's just sort of, okay, th this is my new reality and I'm going on with it. But uh, the way it's treated is often quite intriguing. Um, he's sitting there uh, in the next room. Meanwhile, all was quiet. Perhaps his parents sat whispering at the table with the general manager, or perhaps all of them were leaning against the door listening. He feels betrayed by his family. His parents are taking his boss's side. His boss is, you know, I, I, I think fair to say a little oppressive and they are automatically aligning with him. His mom, it was very funny when she did it, but you're getting this sense that he feels very much alone as if why this would all be so much easier if just anyone would help me. Um, Gregor pushed 
slowly pushed himself over to the door using the armchair, then let go and allowed himself to fall against the door, propping himself upright. The pads of his little legs turned out to be slightly sticky, and there he rested briefly from his exertions. Then he set about turning the key in the lock using his mouth. Unfortunately, it seems he had no real teeth, so how was he supposed to grasp the key? But his jaws turned out to be surprisingly strong, and with their help he actually succeeded in causing the key to move, paying no heed to the fact that he was no doubt injuring himself in the process, for a brown fluid ran out of his mouth and down the key, dropping onto the floor. Which is very specific physicality. You get the sense that uh, Kafka did his homework and really studied how uh, bugs might move and how bugs might do things. You get the sense that this is not just somebody who's speculating, oh, a bug, in generic terms. Uh, he is really paying attention on a very minute scale. And so it lends a kind of realistic credibility to the, uh, to the passage. And you, it gives you a little goal. He's trying to open a door. And uh, it's like, oh, okay. And he's doing this and doing that. And he's working steadily towards the goal. And you get the sense that that's the kind of guy he is. He works steadily towards the goal until this one day when his goal was changed and he couldn't just get out of bed and go work steadily towards his goal. He was given a different set of obstacles. But after practicing, after figuring out how to work the legs, he has, uh, he has realigned himself to a new reality and is once again setting goals and trying to work towards them. Um, Listen to that, the general manager said in the next room. He's turning the key in the lock. Gregor found these words were most encouraging, but all of them should have been cheering him on, including his father and mother. Come on, Gregor, they should have shouted. Keep at it. Just keep at it. Keep working on that lock. He just wants to feel some help, some support, some emotional backing for his efforts, some appreciation. Um, but then he opens the door and he comes out and what you get is sheer horror. Everybody looks. It's nightmarish and you have to feel for him. You have to uh, empathize with this plight of him coming out, you know, hi, this is me now. Maybe this is what I always was underneath. It's sad. Everybody turns from him. Everybody rejects him. His family recoils in horror. The boss, his general manager, just, just absolutely freaks out and runs off. And he's going after him. Gregor's going after him. He's saying, you know, boss, boss, you know, it's okay. We, we can make this work. You go into the office, I'll be there in a little while. Just tell everybody not to freak out. Uh, it'll be fine. <clears throat> Ludicrous. But the earnestness is there. The intention is admirable. The um, sincerity bleeds over into the story itself. It is sincere. It's trying to work with what it has. Gregor's mother, who despite the, general's manage, despite the general manager's presence, stood with her hair still undone from the night, wildly bristling, first looked over at his father, her hands clasped, then took two steps in Gregor's direction before falling down in the midst of all her flowing skirts, her face vanishing completely where it sank into her bosom. Revulsion. Gregor's father clenched his fist. Remember, he is first described as strong. Clenched his fist with a hostile grimace, 
as if he intended to thrust Gregor back into his room, then glanced uncertainly about the living room, shading his eyes with his hands and wept until his mighty chest shook. That fist crumbles and he cries. It's an image of shame, of weakness. Um, Gregor's father is significant. Gregor's father is not going to work. Gregor's father is trying to make sure that Gregor gets up and goes to work. Gregor's father, we're told, thinks breakfast is the most important meal of the day, so much so that he spends a couple of hours having it while reading many newspapers. He does not go to work. Gregor goes to work. Gregor makes a long speech um, where we learn that uh, he feels great uh, earnestness and obligation for uh, to go to work. Um, I am so dreadfully indebted to this to the boss. Surely you are aware of this. The family owes money, and he has to work off that debt. Um, I have my parents and sister to think of. He is their sole support. And you get this long, quite eloquent speech. Where he's begging. Please, sir, do not leave without saying something to show you agree with me, at least to some small extent. He's begging his boss. But the general manager had already turned away as, as soon as Gregor began to speak and merely glanced back at him over a hunched shoulder. His voice is largely now uh, bestial. When he was still inside the room, he tried to speak and everybody just did this. The general manager, most of all, saying, what was that? Because his voice has apparently uh, lost whatever vestiges of humanity it might have had. Um, the, uh, Gregor's sitting there trying to think as the man runs away, you know, uh, Gregor wishes his sister were there. She had run off, uh, looking for help. She was clever. She had already begun to weep while Gregor was still lying quietly on his back. Uh, as surely the general manager, ever the ladies' man, would have let himself be assuaged by her. Uh, his sister's sexuality is suddenly raised there, um, as if that would make things go by. That's a little disturbing, almost. Like, well, is he willing to have, is he willing to trade his sister for sexual favors just so that he could get in good with his boss? I don't really think so. But I think he understands that, well, gee, she's growing up. She's becoming quite a, an attractive young woman. And sure, my boss is a lech. And he would hang around if it weren't for me being so hideous. Um, it's, a, it's a repeated mes uh, message of disgust that everyone feels for him. Although the sister is pointed out that, you know, she is actually showing some compassion there. She's come back and she's, uh, she's crying and, and weeping or whatever at the sight of him. Uh, a sign of the only sign of some compassion, some empathy, some humanity. Um, unfortunately, the manager's flight now appeared to utterly discombobulate Gregor's father who up till then had been re relatively composed. Repeated references to the image of the father and the, um, the reaction that he has and his role within the family. Uh, he's not necessarily taking charge of anything. He's not, he's not dealing with, he just sort of lets this boss come into his home and start, you know, uh, turning everything upside down uh, before they even open the door. Um, it's, uh, it's a curious, curious
characterization that is going to become more significant as the story develops. Uh, but he is starting to stir a little with disgust and in that disgust find a kind of action. He has been very passive so far, uh, very, you know, demanding that Gregor get out of bed, but, uh, you know, very weak. But something about the revulsion, something about the horror of it, of Gregor's transformation, um, seems to have stirred him. Gregor's father drove him backward, uttering hissing sounds like a wild man. That's a rather strong image, a rather uh, imposing image. Uh, if only Gregor had been permitted to turn around, he'd been back in his room at once, but he was afraid of provoking his father's fury. So he is afraid of his father. Whether or not his father is necessarily really that threatening, Gregor perceives it to be, perceives him to be that threatening. Gregor, who saw his father as strong and is now very afraid that he is uh, of provoking his fury. Um, and remember, the man was just weeping a few minutes ago. Um, he now drove Gregor before him, making a great din. And he's just shoving him back in the room. He doesn't want Gregor to come out. He is shoving him back in so that they can shut the door. And you get this long description of this activity of shoving him back in. And it's, it's a sense of chaos. And we still have no answers about what's going on. But there's a lot of activity. A lot of emotions are at high pitch. And a lot of chaos is just bubbling all over the place. And you have no idea what's going on. And then, at last, it was all still very end of that first part. The mimetic chaos of this passage comes to a very quick close and we're all just like, we have no answers. We don't know what's going on. You have this weird guy who wakes up as a bug. He has a bizarre family life. He has a weird job or at least a weird boss. Uh, he feels somewhat persecuted, he feels obligated, he is trying to do his best, but he has been horribly incapacitated by fate, and we have no idea why. We feel for him, and yet we're disgusted by him. That bit about the brown goo falling onto the floor is disgusting. It's horrifying and we don't necessarily want to see it, but we understand that it is a part of nature. And so we're struggling for a relationship to that identity, to that curious identity that is Gregor Samsa. It's a remarkable start to this story that will only get more bizarre. And <clears throat> in the process, it, uh, it's very entertaining, it is very thought-provoking, and it has captured the imagination of, uh, well, it captures the essence of the modernist imagination and points to the possibilities of where art, somewhat untethered from reality, but couched in terms that reality allows uh, and where art is going to go.